really, really a, a lot of cool stuff to check out. So before we, there's a mosquito in my. And I have to ask, does it come with a face? It does not come with a face. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this drill to some places that uh, most drills can't go. Can't wait to see it. <laughs> All right, no. uh, spindle speed is at 2820. Woo! And sometimes there is a disconnect between people who do the designs relative to what you can actually achieve with a tool. Is, is that proprietary? Yeah, for this case, we'll see. Tell me you'd have to kill me. <laughs> All right. I sacrifice your GoPro. <laughs> you'd hear a loud bang followed by my tears. <laughs> I fix it for you, right? Because then I'd have to be on the payroll. There's the case. Understood. <laughs> You're not going to peck with us. Not at all. What's up, guys? Ian Sandusky from Lakewood Machine and Tool, back here again for Practical Machinist. Today, we're going to be checking out the Walter Tools Technology Center. Really, really excited to show this to you guys. We're here in Wisconsin. The guys here are super knowledgeable. They do educational stuff here. They do tool testing here. They do research and development here. We're gonna go check it out, meet the team, and show it to you. Let's go. John Jansen, and um Good to have you in here today. Thank you very much for having us in today. Very much appreciated. Now, what do you do here at Walter? Well, here at this facility, much like any one of our technology centers around the globe, we do customer testing, we do customer demonstrations, as well as training for our customers. Myself, I, I've lived and grown up in the area all my life. Uh, 28 years as a machinist. Oh, wow. Uh, started off making uh, carbide tools from whether they were from solid or from preformed blanks where we cool. finish and hold tolerances within the millions. Over this way, when we talk uh, indexable ISO turning, of course we have a full line of that. What, what is we, what is ISO turning? Our ISO turning is the uh, same size insert, same shape insert across the board. So it's standardized okay. from whether it's Walter or any of the other uh, tool suppliers out there, that same shape, size, could be found in all manufacturers. So basically, even if I don't have a Walther bar, I can still use that insert as long as I'm using the right one. Absolutely, right? Interesting. In any shape out there. We have uh, solid carbide drills, right? Whether they're pilot drills or all the way to 50 times D standard. Right? So now what does that mean for those who might not right, know? Right, so in the case of this, this is 12 times diameter, meaning that we'll take the diameter of the drill itself, lay it on the side, and end to end, that diameter will equate to 12 times depth. When does that get really tricky when you're drilling holes? So it, each, uh, each application is slightly different, but uh, typically it gets tricky for a lot of people anytime over 30. Yeah, say. that's kind of what I was thinking as well. Whether it's an indexable where you have a uh, near flat bottom, allowing you to go through interruptions and, and really be versatile. It could even use it as a boring tool if you like. Yeah, you could you if you needed to, right? right? Step it off and... Uh, bore with it. Do you guys do that? Absolutely. You can Interesting. Re, you can actually uh, acquire some of the best finishes by doing this as well. Really? Yeah. And I guess you save on tool change time as sure. well. Sure. You have a very rigid tool on top of it. And then what do we got here? This is a, this an is insertable a speed drill. drill. Right? Point drill. So here we can actually put in, uh, say, we use the same body across the spectrum of material. Again, steels, cast irons, uh, non-ferrous. We'll have a tip uh, just for that material. In this case, uh, you can see it's blue. So again, to the ISO class, there's a uh, uh, the blue color, and ISO P is, stands for steel, right? Oh, interesting. So here you can absolutely see that this drill, being that's blue coated, is ready to go for steel. And that way you know which one you got in at the same right. time. Something that's a, a little bit faster than cut tap, and we're looking at thread forming. Right, so we're actually uh, distorting the material, pushing the material, opposed to actually making a chip. Right. Meaning that we don't have any problems with chip nesting, uh, evacuating those chips, disposing you're them. you're not making any? No. Right. Now, what, what, what kind of application would you have for this? Would this be for thin wall stuff, or would you go straight through thick material with this as well? Uh, thick material as well. You could go up to uh, mid, mid to low 40s in the way of Rockwell. Oh, wow. On that, right. 
Uh, mostly in the automotive where you have to make a lot of threads very, very fast. Mm, that makes right. a lot of sense. I take it this wouldn't be really for the aerospace guys. This is more for high volume production stuff. Right. In the way of aerospace, uh, few applications can use it, but that material has to remain that same material. You can't work cold harden it in this case, right? Case, right? So you get yourself in trouble that way. And these obviously are thread mills. Absolutely. And that's some of the fastest way to do it if you're good at it, right? Most reliable way, I like to say, because we don't have to worry about what if the, what if their cut tap breaks off in the part? Been right? there. Yeah. Been <laughs> like there. We all have. Been there this week. <laughs> so in a way of a thread mill, that allows us versatility. We can make different uh, types of threads. We can do yep. ID, ODs with these as well. And these would be a, a multi-point, obviously, thread mill, uh, as opposed to something like a single, where you have a thread mill that just has one of those hanging out. Right. We're, we're trying to find the most productive solution. So while we have a lot of teeth in this one, maybe that's too many teeth in some applications. So we'll have a skip row design where we have less deflection. Oh, interesting. Right. Now, I believe you're going to take us and show us the rest of your facility here in just one moment. Absolutely. I think Perfect. I'm going to also introduce you to a couple of my colleagues along the way. Yeah, it looks uh, kind of like a tab, doesn't it? But it actually is a drill. Um, you will notice uh, there's no conventional margin for this drill. Uh, the margins are all here. This whole thing is a margin. We don't have, we don't grind a margin relief. So that means the drill is supported the whole way under the cutting force. There's so much beef to support it. Is this, uh, is this a ma major product for Walter these days? Yeah, it's one of our supreme products. So it's, uh, you know, top end, high productivity, high tool life for, you know, big manufacturing. The problem with, ha you don't see drills like this in right. uh, industry because uh, when you have a margin like that, there's so much friction. And that's where our innovation comes in. We pride ourselves on the geometries and the grades and the innovation. Right. And the way R&D guys solved it is these grooves. These are actually coolant grooves. So oh, interesting. It, yeah, so when the coolant comes out, uh, it speeds up and takes, uh, takes more and more uh, heat away. And that's why this is able to stay cool. You know, like it takes more and more heat away. So you can drill harder. Drill faster. Drill, uh, and yep, and because of those margins, you can really do well with cross holes, incline entry or exits, or any of the challenging applications. And these are some of the actual drills themselves. Yeah, right these here. are. Uh, yeah, these go up to 30 times diameter. Starting, 30 times diameter. Yeah, wow. starting from three times diameter up to 30. And. And now, are these polished just for show, or is that actually how they come no, in? No, this is how they come in. Uh, all of Walter's drills that go beyond 12 times D, we usually have them polished. Uh, that usually also means there's a lot of extra processing that goes right. on. And that's, <laughs> that's, that's necessary to get the chips out. Well, I've always, you know, all my life I came here for my masters and oh. uh, throughout my time here, whatever 22 years I've been in the industry, I've always somehow related with drills. Even my previous job, I was doing gun drilling. And oh, fair enough. So you actually have a lot of, yeah, it's, it's not just a, a product category. Yeah, it's, it's like more of a, a yeah, it's with. somehow, it, it just came together that way. Before this, you were actually in a machine shop? Uh, yeah, before this, I worked for a machine tool builder that makes uh, deep hole drilling machine tools. Oh, so so. <laughs> not only were you doing gun drilling, you were making the machine tools. To do yeah, it. yeah. So in addition to the demonstrations that we do, the testing that we do, we also do research and development. And do you do some of those tests yourself? Absolutely. I have no... Uh, uh, I'm very familiar with pressing the green button myself. Right before you showed up, we were actually uh, getting ready to, to machine this piece of titanium. That's we're, titanium? That's a $5,000 piece of titanium. I was gonna say, I thought that was a big chunk of aluminum and I was impressed. <laughs> so here we're doing an end mill study. If we want to change the geometry of our tool or if we want to compare it to say some of the competitors that are out in the industry and right. see where we fit in this, this is a great way to do it. Along with a number of other things that we can study on here, right? How much the radial engagement was. Can we improve on some, what customers are typically doing and say with this new design, we can take off more, saving you time on your spindle. That's amazing. Yeah, so 12,000 RPM, 
46 horsepower thereabouts. 46 horsepower. 46 horsepower. You're not here. bogging that thing, no. No. And this actually pallet changes out to the other side. It does. So whether we're doing demonstrations or testing, and in this case, titanium. We've got a piece of aluminum over here. I recognize that from out front. There you go. Or perhaps we're doing something in the way of dynamic milling in steels or 316. Or if we have a very unstable workpiece here and we want to see how our, uh, our cuts are going to perform by hanging off in the space like this, like I hope to show you shortly. What we're going to see is a part that's unstable. It's hanging off the workpiece here. Uh, we're going to do a couple different milling techniques on it in the way of uh, Circle and turbulation around the outside of it. We're going to do some full slotting on this. Perfect. Let's All right. let's watch her go. All right. Let's take a look. Here's our so work this piece. is the part over here. All right. What we're going to do is we're going to first start off by circling around this workpiece. Right. We're using the practice of radial chip thinning on here to ensure that we're keeping a, a chip the thickness that we want. 12 cutting edges on here, make short work. We're traveling in the upwards of 300 inches a minute right now. Now, when that's cutting right now, I'm not seeing a whole lot of chatter. Is that due to the short nature of the holder or is that the effective cutting edge? It's a number of things. It's this, uh, the short holder here for the most part. We have a very stable geometry that's on here. What's our next up? Next up, we're gonna go ahead and do some face milling with it. Now, why this is a shoulder mill, typically producing a 90 degree shoulder on okay. here, Many people use them as face mills as well, so we'll see how well a 12 effective 90 degree face mill works in this case. We'll come in and we'll start whittling it down little by little. We'll take deeper and deeper cuts as we go, or wider AE, or radial engagement. And while we're running this dry, and it's not just for the cameras, we're running this dry because it's steel. If we actually introduce coolant on here for whatever reason, it could actually bring our tool life down. Really? Yeah, what's happening during the cut right now the tool's getting hot, the cutting edges are hot. Right. If we were to introduce coolant to it, now we have this uh, temperature fluctuation, hot, cold, hot, cold. Interesting. All right, and what that'll actually lead to then is thermal cracks. So again, we're building our geometries, our grades to help prevent whatever the type of wear mode's gonna happen in your particular material. Right. Next up, what we're gonna do is we're gonna come in, we're gonna start full slotting. Oh boy. All right. So we're gonna take this mill and we're gonna feed it in from both sides. So again, that looks like it's taking about 80 thousand depth of cut, if not right. more. Here we are again, and now we're doing the full engagement of that two inch diameter. Wow. Again. Now with the piece that's hanging that far off like that, what do we wanna to do to try to minimize vibration when it's hanging out and we're making a cut sideways like this? Sure, if we can't do anything to secure the part any more than the fixture builder already did or right. the setup engineer did on here, we're gonna to have to look at geometries. We have geometries that allow us to be more stable in the cut by having a land on the end of it. Right. Or maybe some uh, operations require a sharper edge. So again, being able to have an indexable insert where you can change that configuration lends itself to limit it possibilities. And here we have the D4120, all right? So we have uh, two square inserts, if you will, on here, one center and one on the outboard on this. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this drill to some places that uh, most drills can't go. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna drill a series of holes here and we're gonna chain them together. Okay. Ideally, you wanna drill a solid hole first, as many of those as you can, and then get in between so you're those. you're gonna be going between the holes. Right. Essentially pocketing with the drill. What's our speed, what's our uh, feed on that right now? Here we're running at uh, 354 millimeters a minute. Wow. That thing is having no problems whatsoever. No whatsoever, very deep. And now we're gonna take out the uh, lands in between that. And this is where you typically have problems with deflection. You can have problems with deflection. Uh, you can have uh, issues with uh, tools that just can't make it. Not only that, there are gonna be cross holes uh, involved as well as we get through this. Straight now, that's just plunging straight in. Straight in and through the interruptions as well. Not deflecting off to one side, on one side. not slowing down. Woo. So for our next feat with this, we're gonna drill not on a flat surface, not on a radius surface. We're gonna do both. We're gonna do both at the same time. We're gonna do both here as we come into this workpiece on a 45 degree no. angle. No 
a problem. And that's unsupported as well. Unsupported. That would make me cringe if it was in a vice. Just that's like hanging a, out in the middle of nowhere. That's just, eight inches out in the middle of nowhere. Just like our uh, million tools, our indexable drills, we can put on different geometries and grades to ensure that we have uh, the capable insert in there to do the job. But you just hit that from three different angles all using the same insert. Right. So they're pretty versatile. Absolutely. Wow. This drill here is a standard drill, but it's a step drill. So it's a drill and chamfer all in one. Beautiful. High precision drill. We have it in a shrink fit holder. We're going to go ahead and pop some holes uh, under the flat here. Oof. Wow, that thing's just ramming through. We're looking at 874 millimeters a minute on this. And what's your spindle speed right now? Uh, spindle speed is at 2820. Woo! Yeah, it gets a little warm. Next up, what we're bringing in is our TC620. Now, this is a thread mill, but it has uh, a pitch or a, a spacing where the threads are every other. This is going to allow us to do a couple of things, right? It's going to reduce the chances of any kind of chatter, okay. uh, vibration on here because we don't have so much carbide in the cut, right? right. Uh, what that's also going to allow us to do, less carbide means we can bring up our surface footage. So we're going to oh. run this faster. So we're going to do a, uh, the full length of that thread there in about seven seconds. Seven seconds. Seven seconds. All right, let's see. With a thread mill. With a thread mill. And guys, that's fast even for a tap. Matter of fact, that part of the program was uh, came right from our Walter GPS. Right on our website, we're able to get running parameters. And in this case of a thread mill, we can actually get the program as well. Complete plug and play. Yep. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the equipment that we have here, Ian. Uh, here, run of the mill, mill if you will, right? We have a Haas VF3YT. On this machine, we have a Cat 50 spindle. Okay. Here, we're doing a customer test in the way of some connecting rods. Okay. This customer has a new blend of powdered metal, and they're uh, looking at uh, improving their tool life and uh, their hole quality. So they were having some problems with getting that hole quality, and they were burning out tools? They're burning out tools faster than they would like. Right. So part of what we do here in this facility is tool tests. Okay. Here we're going to take a look at a couple different geometries and suggest, okay, now we, we know that the standard tool performed like this. Now let's make it into a full-blown special where you have multiple diameters and steps, chamfers and things like this. On it. Uh, here, a customer is uh, interested in exploring some of our tools in the way of stainless steel. Now, this is 304L, L meaning that it's low carbon. So right. Really stringy, tough to break a chip. It wears and, out your tools. So in the way of our mills, an Inox mill that's made uh, specifically for stainless steels, you're going to have a polished cutting edge. You're going to have uh, polished flutes. You're going to have coolant through even on the end mills. To really fight that work hardening. Now in these, are you actually going to drill a hole that deep in 304? Right, we're going to drill that deep, as you can see the workpiece is that long as well. So we're going to drill through on that. Uh, anytime that we're looking at a drill that's over 16 times D, right. right, we're looking at using a pilot first. So we'll pilot that hole two times D, and then from there, we'll drill the entire 30, 40, And that would be your times. pilot. That's right. So you pilot it, that's going to go through straight. Absolutely, and without pecking, wow. might I add. So very efficient in the way it's being machined. You're not going to peck with that? Not at all. Now, does, would the peck increase the wander, or is that strictly for efficiency? Well, here a number of things that it's going to do against you. One, it's going to wear out your tool faster. Two, in the way of stainless steel like this, you're going to uh, run your chances of that work hardening right. even more so. Tool right, so production, uh, tool life, and just quality of the whole all together. I am the customer, this is my crankshaft. I come in, I have a problem. Can you walk me through typically what we're gonna go through and what I can expect? Sure, absolutely. Uh, you've supplied us with the print. Maybe you've supplied us with the program of uh, what wasn't working for you so well, right? right? Supplied us with the issues of chip control was an issue, right? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a look at uh, first mimicking the hole, putting in the pre-drilled hole that you have first, coming in and then actually sizing the bore with yet another drill. Right. right. So the turning tools that we need to prep and even the tool holder, if we need to have a certain tool holder for your application, we'll get that all in. The only thing that you had to do for us was bring in that material That's it. and your problem. This is 
our machine room here at the Walter Tech Center. In it, we house all of the machines that we have available to do customer testing that John already talked about. We prove out our own tools. We refine the processes for our customers that we can do it offline at our facility so they don't have to take up production time. And specifically, we, I want to show you some of our highly engineered product that is specifically designed for components. Wow. What am I looking at here? These are crankshaft machining cutters. So we have two different styles, what we call an OD machining, okay. where the machine's on the OD of the cutter, or even an ID machining, where we're actually machining on the ID of the cutter. That is crazy. Both of these are used to produce the journal bearings on a crankshaft. Typically, we see the OD to do the pins where the connector rod So that's connects. in there, right? Yes, in here or here. And the ID is typically used to do the journal bearings. Now, on something like this, I mean, I see something that size. Would you use a cutter this size to produce a part that size? Exactly that size. So what's, can you explain to me why you do such a big cutter? Yes. There's a couple different reasons. <clears throat> One, we get more inserts in it, so we get a long tool life. As you can imagine, most crankshafts are very high production and throughput is very critical. Right. So more inserts, more teeth, higher throughput, but also because of the large diameter, better surface finish on the journal. Now, when you're doing, Something like this, like this is a production tool. This is a How pro often do you have to rotate all these inserts? Well, ideally we like to get at least one shift or two. So oh, really? the automotive industry typically works in quantities of how many shifts. Right. So if, if uh, you can increase tool life from one shift to one and a half, sometimes that's not always an advantage. You have to right. go to a full second shift. Now this one here, what does that do on this thing? This will, uh, it, it would be standing upright. It okay. would come in and, and swallow the crank and it would machine the, where the connector rod, because the, the journal for the connecting rod is not concentric to the crankshaft. The main journals are, so they're much easier to machine. Right. But this you have to rotate around and maintain the concentricity around a center line that's off center. See, and depending practice. on how the part's configured, whether it's a four cylinder, six cylinder, eight cylinder, you may see some of these gang together. Stacked up. Yeah, and wow. so you may have three come in and swallow up the crank and do three journals at once. We even have a special tool for doing the post end, which is where the uh, timing gear right. connects. So it's a special tool that just comes in and hollow mills the end of it. Oh, I see. That's actually cutting all sides of it at once. Yep, yep. cuts in the center there. The inserts are mounted on the ID. And even uh, special drills for the uh, oil holes, which you have to go from one journal bearing to the next journal bearing, so you get a nice even... Uh, pressure on the journal bearing. So you would see probably uh, the, the main journal bearings would be maybe like op 20 or op 30. Oh, the, wow. The pin journals would be op 40. Uh, the Oof. post end might be like op 60 or 70, something like that. And drilling is usually one of the last ones. There's a lot that goes into one of those. I mean, it's probably interesting to know that most automotive manufacturers spend more money machining the crank than they do the block or the head combined. So now you're looking at aerospace components, whether it's something structural like this, made out of titanium. That's titanium. This is titanium. Wow. Uh, in the aerospace industry, especially structural components, they say the buy to fly weight is right. as low as five to 10%. So that means if I start with something that weighs 100 pounds, the finished part, like the material would be uh, 100 pounds, the finished part is five pounds. And that's when a tool like this comes into effect. It might be hard to believe, but you can actually full slot in titanium with this tool. And what's the advantage of having that many inserts at once? Because that just looks like a lot. Maximum material removal rate. That's it. Just That's to fog out as much as possible. Yeah. So there you have it guys. Thank you very much to the team at Walters for letting us come out and check this out today. I really appreciate the fact that not only are they doing educational stuff here, but they're doing straight up research. Um, it's really interesting to have machines dedicated to not only you know helping prove things out for their, for their customers, but to actually push tools to the limits and test out different variations on you know cutters and inserts to try to make the best tool possible. Um, I think that's amazing and I really hope they keep going with it. And I hope you guys found that as interesting as I did. Make sure you guys like and subscribe below if you want to see more videos. We are going to be doing some more of these, so make sure you drop some comments below to let us know what you thought of this. Thank you very much for watching, guys. You take care.